I'm Raj Kumar. I'm the president and editor-in-chief of DevX. Uh, and it is great to see all of you here. If, if some of you have been over in the annual meeting venue, this is a nice respite from that. Uh, a, a real chance to get out of the heat, to get out of the chaos, and to be with, I guess, comrades, I would say, because this is a group of people who are all working on and care about some of the key issues that are being raised at this year's annual meetings, uh, particularly around health. So it's a real pleasure for us at DevX to get to work with our partners at MSD for Mothers uh, to bring you this event, which I think is a critically important one, and, and I'll tell you why. Because if you're in those meetings, you're hearing a lot of, well, jargon, to be frank. You're hearing CAF, you're hearing RST, you're hearing SDRs, you're hearing so-called so sweating the balance sheet. And sometimes I think we get so enamored with the financial engineering that we forget what the point of all of it is, which is ultimately to improve development, to improve health, to actually improve lives. That's the end game here. That's why President Banga and Managing Director Georgieva are here in Marrakesh and all of you and all, all the governments and civil society are here is because we see a big opportunity. That is particularly in focus when you think about cancer. Um, cancer is one of those areas that if the billions can be raised or even the trillions can be raised would be the logical place to invest. Why? It's the second leading cause of death in the world. 70% of those deaths are in low and middle income countries. Not something that is well known outside of this room. I know you all know this well, but it's not something that's really, I think, penetrated the mainstream understanding of, of cancer and where the burden of disease is. In addition to that, if you look at individual cancers, let's take cervical cancer, 90% of the new cases and deaths are in low and middle income countries. So this is very much a global challenge, not just a rich world challenge. And so the funds that are being raised, the balance sheets that are being sweated, uh, ought to put cancer very much in focus. And I know it is for, for all of you here, but this is why MSD for Mothers, this is why, I'm sorry, MSD and DevX wanted to gather uh, all of you together to talk at this moment here in Marrakesh about what the opportunity actually is. How do we take this issue forward? What's really gonna come out of those meetings that are happening across the way? So with that, we're gonna have a kind of a fireside chat to get our conversation going. Uh, there is no fire, but we got flowers in between us. Um, and we're going to get our conversation going, and then we're going to move to a panel, and then we're going to open it up to everyone. So I hope you all can contribute today. Uh, we have Allison Cox, who's the Policy and Advocacy Director of the NCD Alliance, with us virtually. Hi, Allison. Hello. Good evening. So, so I assume that you uh, vehemently agree with me on my <laughs> broad opening, but to, how, how do you see the fight for UHC and the relevance of cancer, particularly at a moment like the annual meetings? Uh, well, thanks, Raj, and thanks very much for giving me this opportunity for a, a virtual fireside chat. Um, and just to, before I answer your question, just to quickly give you uh, my credentials. Uh, the NCD Alliance is a global civil society organization, and we've got around 400 members dedicated to a world free from preventable suffering, stigma, disability and death caused by non-communicable diseases. And this issue that we're talking about tonight is central to the foundation of the NCD Alliance. And ever since we were set up in 2009 by the International Federations for Cancer, Lung Disease, Heart Disease and Diabetes, we've been trying to address that fundamental issue that NCDs are the most underfunded global issue relative to the billions of people impacted. Um, you, you brought out some figures for cancer, but just to put it in, in the broader context of, of the, the full range of the major NCDs, they account for 41 million deaths per year worldwide. That's 74% of death. You said cancer was the, the second biggest killer. Um, Hypertension and heart disease is the first. So, um, and there's an absolutely fundamental mismatch between the healthcare needs and the rights of people living with NCDs, particularly in low and middle income countries, and the resources allocated to respond. Um, the official development aid funding allocated specifically to NCDs has remained under 2% of total development aid for health for the last 30 years. 
Um, and I was at a side event, uh, a little similar to this, during the UN General Assembly meetings last month. And I was talking on the side to a leading figure in international health funding in the US. And I asked him my sort of perennial question, which is why did he think non-communicable diseases had been left, like cancer, had been left out of the health and development funding priorities? And he said, well, these diseases are not the problem for children and the most vulnerable around the world. Uh, they, they happen to people like us, he said, by which he meant middle class, older adults, middle aged from higher income countries. And in this response, he was capturing this fundamental misunderstanding about these diseases. They, diseases like cancer, disproportionately affect the poorest and vulnerable populations. Um, of the 15 million premature deaths from non-communicable diseases that occur between the ages of 30 and 70, the prime of life, 85% now occur in low and middle income countries. And most of these could be prevented or delayed. They are a growing burden and we're in a vicious cycle where they're driving poverty and undermining the achievements of the development goals. So they're a human rights inequity issue. Uh, and to give some cancer specific examples of that inequity, uh, you mentioned some Raj, but for a child living in a low or middle income country, the likelihood of surviving cancer is less than 30%. However, if that child was living in a high income country who, where they can access optimal care, that survival rate goes up to 80%. Uh, you mentioned cervical cancer. Nine, in 2018, the figures were that 19 of the top 20 countries with the highest cervical cancer burden were in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and that's a cancer that can be prevented with access to the HPV vaccine, which is widely available in high-income countries. And Alison, you know, I can imagine people in that conference hall saying, okay, you've convinced me that, that there is a myth here that NCDs aren't relevant in low- and middle-income countries or... You know, it's really about infectious diseases, and that is a myth. Maybe, maybe you've helped to bust that already. My guess is everyone in this room is very much uh, in, in agreement with you. But what about the, the economic case? What about for skeptical finance ministers who say, look, we're having, we have a debt crisis as it is. We are trying to figure out how to balance our budget. Uh, this is maybe not the place for global focus and investment at a, at a moment like this, at a moment of climate and pandemics. What, what is the argument from a socioeconomic standpoint? Yeah, so I mean, you, to take that on, uh, you, you can look at this both as a, a cost and an investment point of view. Um, so obviously, it's not just a cost to millions of individuals and households. And I, I can talk to you a little bit more about out of pocket expenditure and the impact of that. But looking at it from that perspective, you're describing, well, first of all, they NCDs are a massive cost to the global economy. Uh, a World Bank report back in 2011 estimated the cost between 2011 and 2030 to the global economy of NCDs being $47 trillion. That's $2 trillion per year. But it's not just the, the cost of the diseases on the economy. It's also that for a long time, there's, they've been branded, you know, action on NCDs has been branded as an expenditure, when in fact, it could be better seen as an investment in the economy because many of the best policies recommended by the WHO are in fact low cost, affordable for every country, and basically represent a smart strategic investment. Um, according to the WHO's NCD best buys package, there would be a return to society for every $1 spent of, of $7 in increased employment, productivity, and longer life. Uh, and so the bottom line for governments is clear, th this investment will deliver a significant return. And there's been another uh, package put together by the Lancet 2030 NCD countdown piece, which they looked at a broader package of 21 NCD prevention and treatment interventions. Um, and these were fully aligned with the WHO ones, but added in some clinical interventions. And using these and modeling those, it showed that nearly all countries could achieve the NCD target by 2030, uh, by implementing these packages, and it avert 39 million deaths in low and middle income countries between now and 2030, but there'd also be economic benefits. And, instead, and the return on investment would, for every $1 spent would be $19. So 
So really significant investment. And you know, just one other point I'd bring in, you, you mentioned pandemic preparedness and response. Um, the figures are actually between 60 to 90% of the deaths from, from the pandemic worldwide were of people with uh, existing uh, preconditions of NCDs, primarily um, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. So tackling um, NCDs through prevention and care would be a significant investment in pandemic prevention and preparedness. You know, a significant number of the excess deaths were, would be addressed by that. that that's, very, that's very true, Alison. And, um, and it comes back to the broader point that when we think about health systems and even primary care, these things are ultimately all connected. And of course, in our understandable ways as donor agencies and implementing parties and partners, we often have to work in verticals, but life doesn't exist in verticals and human lives don't exist in verticals. And uh, this is one of those examples where we see it. And, and maybe on that point, we can begin to broaden the discussion a little bit. And we have Juan Pablo Uribe with us, who leads this portfolio at the World Bank, Senior Director for the Global Health Practice there. Um, and I guess I wonder, Juan Pablo, as you may make this case, have this conversation, think more broadly about health and UHC inside the bank, um, where do NCDs like cancer fit in to the way you describe this to countries, health ministers, finance ministers, and the way they're seeing it? Are, do you find this kind of barrier that we've talked about, uh, uh, the, the myth maybe still persisting? Is there a growing understanding, or what can we do to break through it? So, so Raj, I'll, I'll try to be a little bit polemic here because I think we start from, um, from a different point. Of, of course, we, we understand the whole um, e economic rationale, and, and, but, but we're seeing with incredible concern that we are increasingly fragmenting the health system arena uh, by, by a lot of diseases and specific conditions and putting them to compete one with the other. And I, I, I'm seeing NCDs in that struggle. I'm sorry, but it's struggling to find a space with infectious diseases, with vertical approaches, etc. cetera. And, and, and of course, it, 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 this raising the voice has to happen. But when I was Minister of Health, I never, with the Minister of Finance or to my country, spoke about financing particular diseases. We had to confront and to bring answers to all the diseases. And, and I think that's where the bank stands. So when we're looking at primary health care, we're saying primary health care has to be sufficiently comprehensive, integrated, strong to address NCDs from the beginning. It's not a primary health care that only looks at maternal and child um, conditions, for example, or infectious diseases. And anticipating NCDs in the PHC setting is extremely important. When we look at health financing reforms and we start discussing risk pooling and we start risk discussing health benefit packages, it should start, given the context reality and its capacity, including progressively important financial protection aspects, for example, for cancer. And, and I would continue, when we're looking at provider payment mechanisms, Farid, we discuss in particular how to make them suitable for best behavior and proper quality and high cost expenditure conditions, for example. So what I want to say is we try not to follow the fragmentation. We try to integrate across the health system strengthening from primary health care to high complexity. By the way, just to stop here, it's not only primary health care. There's been a recent discussion around that. And, and it, you, you cannot stand in front of a country and say that high complexity care is not important, that you will not be addressing the challenges of facilitating the best possible access to new technologies that provide cost-effectiveness solutions, for example. So again, I'll stop with saying when we try to fragment and silo the conversations, I think we have a disconnect with the country reality and with the policy choices. It makes life easier for the external assistance and for the ODA, but it's not the way in which in countries health systems will be able to respond. If you're able to show me a health system in a country that only does cancer and avoids the others, or one that turns its back completely on cancer 
without paying a cost, I'm willing to go and visit it. It's a fantastic point, and you're right. We tend to focus on the legitimate rationale for vertical funds, especially in infectious disease, often a political dynamic in donor countries that leads to it. It's a lot easier to go to Capitol Hill and argue for this vertical disease. And there's a legitimate argument that, well, if that's what sells in donor capitals, let's not give up on that. Let's use what works, right? I know we have colleagues here from some, some of those vertically funded organizations. And then you can also argue, well, vertical implementation is sometimes easier. We, can, we know the vaccine to deliver, or we know, you know the, the nutrition intervention to deliver. So you know, in some ways, it's easier to at least understand at a global level. But ultimately, fundamentally, your point is in the health ministry, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, please. And just to conclude, and with Marianne fully, fully, fully aligned, for us, the biggest problem here, we were talking before the meeting started, is that we're investing too little in health systems. Period. In health systems. When you have one or two percent of GDP going to a health system, regardless if you're a low, middle, or high income country, you won't have a high performing system. When you are below five percent of public health spending um, in total in a health system, you're going to have eroding financial protection, Marianne. And that's what's going to happen. You, you will have these difficulties that we're seeing, Rush. And um, I think we should come together around investing more on health systems. And that will raise, by the way, um, our capacity to confront NCDs, which, as you said, are an increasing burden of disease for the poorest and more vulnerable. Right. And, and I think our friends in the vertical funds have really tried to transform themselves over the years and become more oriented toward health systems. But it still is this fundamental mismatch, right, between what donors want to fund and the way they've structured the system and then what health ministers like you when you were in that chair think about it. Farid, you were mentioned, so I want to go to you. You're the Global Director for Health and Education at IFC, so kind of the other side of the, of the house there at the World Bank. In a lot of these countries, uh, the private sector plays a really big role in health systems. Yeah, there's some microphones around if you can pass them. Um, the, the private sector role is really key in a lot of places, particularly when it comes to NCDs. Uh, how do you see this conversation, maybe even debate, as Juan Pablo has, has brought it up, uh, in your own, in your own, from your own perspective at IFC? Oh, thanks. And first of all, you know, we have a lot of debate, uh, Juan Pablo and myself, and uh, very constructive ones, and, and we work hand in hand. But I would say I, I fully agree with him on the fact that it's about strengthening the health system and the continuum of care. And even more in the case of NCDs, you don't, you don't separate you know, at a primary care level, which, by the way, is probably the, the weakest link today in many places throughout the low- and medium-income countries. But if you bring, you know, women and children for maternal and newborn health at a primary care center, you might as well do immunization, do early diagnostic on potential risk of cancer across. And then you do a good job at setting the uh, solutions, the treatment, um, the prevention accordingly. And that does not differentiate from infectious disease or NCDs. This is where it starts. So I think this is, uh, this is something I wanted to say. On the other side, the IFC truly, you know, versus what you know, Juan Pablo's mandate is, which is complementary, is really to work on the private sector supply type of side. You know, I put it in a simplistic way, it's not just supply side, but this is what it means. And in the case of NCDs, it, it can go through, you know, health services providing the right level of diagnostic treatment uh, for NCDs across the spectrum, not just cancer, but diabetes, uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases, which we know is taking the highest toll in the decades to come in, in, uh, in uh, many uh, developing countries and particularly on the continent of Africa. But it's also, you know, localization of both the supply. And uh, we talked about vaccine. David is here from, from Gavi. The whole, you know, subject about, again, localizing production and manufacturing of vaccines, pharmaceuticals, and hopefully biopharmaceuticals in Africa that imports 99% of its vaccines today and 80% of its basic drugs, you know, is something we need to, to fight for. So, you know, putting the, the right means 
through financing, but it's not only financing. Money is just a part of it. And even with IFC, I don't consider that my role is just to unlock loans to the private sector. It's also to augment capabilities through advisory on quality, on regulatory support, um, on digital transformation, uh, for instance. So I think it's definitely strengthening the health system and making sure that there is an available uh, supply side across the value chain of healthcare in uh, locally to, to be able to address NCDs at the right moment and efficiently. I, I want to bring uh, Ann Stars into the conversation, who's the head of resource, the resource mobilization section at the International Atomic Energy Agency. First of all, I'm interested in what the International Atomic Energy Agency does on these issues, but in addition to that, um, I know you're going to talk about the idea of national cancer plans, and, and I'm interested in that topic in part for Juan Pablo's uh, earlier point and, and what we just heard from Farid, which is, look, in the end, health ministries can't just think about disease by disease. They have to think about primary health care. They have to think about an integrated system. Yet, there's an argument that if you don't have a national cancer plan, it will get left by the wayside, especially in low and middle income and resource constrained countries. So. Tell, tell us about your, your view on this and why are, why are national cancer plans important? Okay, thanks so much for having me here. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this session. Um, yeah, the International Atomic Energy Agency is, sounds a bit unlikely in this setting, and yet we have 60 years of experience working in radiation medicine and providing support to our member states in radiotherapy, in radiology, in nuclear medicine, uh, and even in nutrition. So um, we do uh, a lot of capacity building in building the workforce. Um, we also provide uh, procurement of equipment uh, uh, for radiotherapy and radiation medicine. Um, 60 years of experience. And a lot of times that, that support was happening at a cancer care facility or at a hospital. Uh, and then we realized that that was really not hitting the mark and that we needed to move to the national level to make sure that there was some national policy, some national view. So actually almost 20 years ago, we started the program of action for cancer therapy together with WHO and other stakeholders to, to, to put some spotlight on that and to provide assessments of the national country and then to help support with national cancer uh, control planning. Um, and so what we've seen to, to bring the two pieces together about um, universal health coverage and national cancer control planning, how do those things relate to each other? Um, what, we, what we're hearing is that um, in, in countries that, that have not included universal health cover, uh, cancer in their universal health coverage, um, there's just insufficient resources and that, that, that cancer patients are paying out of pocket. And that's placing an undue financial burden on, on, on their population, on their cancer patients. So um, the, recently we've um, begun to include, in the last several years, we've begun to include recommendations to countries as part of our assessments and our uh, support that they, that they include universal health coverage in their national cancer control planning, that they make the link. If I could talk for just a second about some of our other programs, um, you know, the needle has not been moving. You, you talked about the rising incidence of cancer in low and middle income countries. Uh, and our member states are coming to us and asking for more assistance. They're asking, what can we do? What can you do to help us, IAEA? So last year, our director general launched an initiative called Rays of Hope to put more spotlight on our work in cancer care and to really address inequity and in access to, can to radiotherapy and cancer treatment. 20 countries in Af Africa have no, no access, and that's just unacceptable. Your geography should not, uh, where you were born, should not determine whether or not you have access to life-saving treatment. So Rays of Hope has had a tremendous response from IAEA member states. About a third of our members have come forward um, and either requested assistance or offered to help. Uh, and actually, Morocco was recently designated, uh, the National Cancer Institute here was recently designated as an anchor center, as a center of excellence um, to support countries in the region, African-speaking, uh, French-speaking countries in Africa, 
uh, for training and for uh, quality assurance. So we really thank you for that and congratulations. Um, but but how is how are we moving forward under rays of hope? The, the need is great. Um, these countries are doing national assessments, and what we're seeing is that the the needs um, are for capacity building, for technology. There's there's just not enough resources out there, and so this is something that we really want to to look at. We've we've decided that what we need to change our approach to the private sector. We used to see them only as uh, a supplier, and so we kept them a bit at arm's length. Uh, just recently, in the last couple of months, we've signed agreements with some of the major companies that have uh, an equity in cancer care, and we're bringing them in as knowledge partners. And for us, this is a game changer. We want to bring all players around the table. Uh, and so, you know, I'm sure there's players around this table um, that we would like to hear from as we, as we think about how to support countries under rays of hope. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Marianne, uh, Marianne Etiebet is the Associate Vice President for Health Equity at MSD, our partner in hosting this event. Thanks for partnering, uh, Marianne. And you've just been called a game changer. So I've got to, I've got to go to you with that. Um, you know, you, I think what Ann said is just so true um, that so often we think of the private sector in these contexts as somewhere downstream, right? The policy gets made and the private sector will simply react to incentives you're in a different position now because you're thinking about health equity um, and you're thinking about all the resources that a, a huge organization like MSD brings to bear on an issue like cancer. So how do you align your own strategy as a company on these issues with the realities of vertical funding, of you know donor interest in different areas, of institutions like the World Bank and the IFC? How do you think about how you're going to take forward your focus on cancer care? Well, thank you so much for the question, Raj, and, and it's great to be able to join folks uh, virtually. Um, I, I think our company, MSD, is in a unique position, and I am actually really heartened you know, by the comments that folks have already made around how we need to get together across the silos, whether they're the silos of the therapeutic uh, focus areas and vertical programming, or they're the silos between private sector, civil society, and government. And you know what I do want to kind of put down for everybody on the table is when we leave this round table, um, what are we going to do together uh, to move what it sounds like to me, uh, an alignment and consensus you know, about a direction and about a vision, uh, but to actually move it into action together. Um, so I just, just wanted to put that on the table. Um, from an MSD perspective, um, I think what is really exciting in our company um, is this commitment uh, to increasing access to health for all of the communities that we work in and serve. Um, and in particular, thinking about how we are advancing health equity uh, in low and middle income countries and doing so from all the levers that we can pull as a company, uh, whether that be the levers in our philanthropic uh, part of the company, uh, where we have longstanding partnerships and experiences that we can bring to bear in helping to strengthen health systems and invest in primary care and invest in people who are delivering this care, investing in innovation, uh, that's hopefully creating efficiencies uh, to, to reach more people with the education and awareness, um, as well as the work that we are doing um, as part of our business and, and increasing access and bringing innovation to the table. I think, Allison, you are the person who mentioned, you know, just the incredible innovation that a vaccine can be in terms of preventing cancer and thinking of, you know, how much money that is saving uh, uh, budgets, you know, for, for for future health costs, you know, to actually take care of folks who may be diagnosed with cancer, and unfortunately, also may be diagnosed with cancer too late. And so I do think that there's a framework to think uh, about where we can um, identify and lean into savings, you know, not just from focusing on prevention, uh, but from looking at um, some of the traditionally vertical programs, and I, I really appreciate the point from um, 
uh, Dr. Juan Pablo around, you know, many, many of these programs are investing in primary health care centers, are investing in health system strengthening, and they can be leveraged, you know, for broader comprehensive care for, for, for people, for all the health needs of people. But I don't think that we've gone far enough in actually sitting down at the table and looking at our funds and looking at what they're doing in a specific geography uh, to actually realize on that vision for patients. Um, and so, you know, what, what I do want to say, and I think the question you asked me, Raj, was, you know, sitting where we're sitting with both the experience on strengthening health systems in the philanthropic space and thinking about what we can bring to the table as a private company, whether it's our innovations or our technical expertise or our know-how, as Anne said, uh, you know, we, we are here for it. And we are looking forward to working with everyone around the table um, to bring that experience to bear. Yeah, thank you for that, Marianne. And I agree, I think there is consensus here, which is why I wanna invite anyone around the table to kind of push back on us and tell us what are we missing or what is the, you know, if there is broad consensus that, that cancer and NCDs matter, and if there is a kind of a general view that, look, the way the, health, the global health system is structured doesn't necessarily match the needs or realities on the ground, what are we missing to get from here to there? Um, and I open it to anyone who wants to. Juan Pablo, go ahead. So I, I want to very quickly bring um, uh, an angle that is out there in, in practical terms Again, thinking about the discussions I also had in hospital settings, um, and we haven't tried it. And, and Alison and Marianne, it's, it's intrinsic to cancer, unfortunately, still. And it's that even though we're progressing much more on prevention and um, we've been able to identify technologies that are highly cost-benefit and cost-effective, we still rely on critical oncological interventions that are high cost, extremely high cost. And where you're sitting in a lower middle income country, most of that technology at downstream, nuclear radiotherapy, uh, therapeutic, is extremely expensive. And that brings a particular color to the cancer discussions within health systems. I think that's something that, is, that, that we need to acknowledge, Raj, and to put it on the table itself. Again, it makes, it makes the cancer discussion particularly difficult at that level. It's so important to say that, and I agree. Uh, you know, health ministers I've talked to, when they hear cancer, they think dollar signs. They think expensive. And, you know, this is not necessarily the way to think of an issue like this when it's an integrated continuum of care and when there are, for, as Marianne mentions, you know, vaccines that can prevent certain cancers at a very inex in a very inexpensive way. And so busting that myth may be just as important as busting the myth about you know, cancer isn't a relevant disease in low and middle income countries. Who else wants to jump into the, the conversation? Do you want to say something, please? Right. And ju just mention who you are, please, as you do that. That's fine. I think somebody was trying to speak. Oh. Uh, actually, I was actually about to ask questions. Uh, it seems like we're sitting here for, together here for a reason. I, I also feel like asking some questions. But, but my name is Gilberto Yao. I, I work for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, in D.C. Uh, I'm the head of uh, West and North, West and Central Africa, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The issue of NCD has always been extremely important for our members. I think we have M um, MSD, but we also have a lot of companies that focus on that. In fact, three years ago, we work on the white paper that all the company came together to actually put, uh, you know, why it's important to focus on NCD. Uh, and I tend to uh, disagree a bit about my friend Pablo. Um, I know he was trying to be controversial, but I think uh, health expenditure uh, is so huge, unless very few are spent. You spoke about less than 5% of GDP. So where do we start? Where do we start? Because if you look at the statistics, I think they are staggering. They're talking about every two seconds a person dies from NCD. That is about 85% occur occurrence in low and middle income. And they're also saying that investing a dollar in NCD would generate more than $7 in increased economic development. So if you look at the data, the hard data, it seems to me that if you want to create a dent in this huge problem, 
probably this, a good starting point could be the NCDs. Uh, so uh, money would never be enough, you know. And even in terms of financing, maybe we should think about, you know, blending finance. How do we bring private sector, or we create the condition for private sector to invest even more in, into that system? So I'm also wondering how do we, where do we start and how do we do that? And I also want to comment quickly to say that when it comes to council, it's true specifically now with AI and many other technology, we have seen that council is not uh, as, you know, non-affordable. Uh, there's a way to, to really get people to be, you know, to get into that uh, sector. Yeah, thank you for, and thank you for uh, bringing a little debate to the discussion. I, I want to ask Veronica to chime in, if you can pass a microphone down to her, and we'll take a few more thoughts and ideas uh, and come back to our original panelists. So go ahead, Veronica. No, I don't think it's on. You got to press the, press the button there. Okay, now it's green now. Thank you. Uh, Veronica Scott is with me. And thank you so much for the invitation, uh, both from you and, and MSD. Delighted to be here. I don't really have a lot of prepared remarks, so to speak, but I would uh, just, just share from a, an insurance standpoint, uh, because you invited us to, you know, why is it not happening? Yeah. So I think what we're trying, personally, I think what we want to see is improved access uh, to, for people that can't afford it, right? And in reality, the, 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 that is the ultimate, I say, um, if you're the, the, the holy grail, but there are layers of issues that we experience as a, as a reinsurance provider, and we're the largest, one of the largest reinsurers in the world. We have the largest life and health book, so for us, this is really part and parcel of what we do. So we've been expanding around the world uh, insurance for critical illness, and within that, particularly cancer care. And I think there's been a massive push from the insurance industry and ourselves over the last 10 years. And, uh, and I think this is, so the first step that we need to make there, the next step is how do we improve the coverage for new experimental drugs, which are extremely expensive. And they need to be covered within the systems because they become otherwise unaffordable. So I think it's it, it creating a framework where these costs can be socialized would make, I, I believe, a difference. Um, however, where cancer critical illness insurance does not exist, and I don't have statistics for you, but it's by and far in any and all emerging markets, there is a big gap in that sense. I think the, the conversation for us is, how do we create the financial incentives for that to be established? And, and so the belief we come from is one that it can be prevented, so we need to think of this as a value-based therapy, but it, need, it only works and it gets financed if it is operating in a value-based healthcare system. And I find that most healthcare systems around the world are all about cost base and the insurance system is cost-based. And so you have a fundamental misalignment between objectives. So that's my second observation. My third observation would be specifically around vaccines, which is something that we are quite intrigued to help and mainstream because we absolutely believe, takes for, in, for instance, HPV. We do know, statistically speaking, that there where they've been rolled out, you will see many years down the road benefits in terms of cervical cancer, for instance. The challenge that, that we have, but I, I pose it as a challenge that we absolutely would love to be able to solve together, is how do we create an alignment between the vaccination, which is actually not expensive, and the clinical outcome? Because the clinical outcome is very much, so vaccine is very high de age dependent. You need to vaccinate early, as early as possible, across the population, male and female. And, but the, the real evidence comes decades later. And, and it's again, it's a system of incentive, uh, if I can be very direct. 
uh, because as people age, they may move off state and go into employment benefit. And from an insurance industry perspective, we don't really get to track the benefit of those we've helped vaccinate when they were 15 to 25, and those who actually will buy insurance. And so, it, it, you know, the insurance covers, especially through employee benefits, every two, three years rolls off. So. My, my solution, if I could offer one, is that we need to work in public-private partnerships that create that incentive. What we've been exploring is, can we extract enough value out of HPV vaccination short-term? Because I can't offer today a cover, I'm not allowed to offer you a cover, that vaccinates someone at 15 and then gets compensation and stays in place until they're 50, 60, which is when cervical cancer incidence really starts to show up. So we know that this is the, the, the science should work, but how do we get the clinical evidence for the lives that we help protect today? And how do we have a system, and I, I would love for Gabby maybe to answer there, because we actually think one of the critical execution elements is having the administration of the vaccine and being able to trace it over time. And we see huge disparity in this tracing ability across populations. Well, Where the tracing happens, we can maybe attach. But in most countries that need it, that, that, that capacity is not there. Well, what Guevara brought up is that, of course, technology is advancing quickly and some of that traceability which is a technical challenge, is becoming easier to do in many parts of the world. Um, David, let, let's go to you. I'd love to, love to hear your thoughts on that. It's such important comments, Veronica, um, you know, because I think you're making me think about market shaping, right? And not, not just thinking about verticals where we started or government, you know, public versus private, but the whole market and how do you shape it for the end result. Go ahead, David. Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel, uh, it's a, Veronica, a really good segue for, for me to speak. So I'm David Kinder, the Director of Development Finance at Gavi, um, uh, and one of the vertical funds mentioned by uh, Juan Pablo. And, and, and I guess I think I, I, what I wanted to come with first of all is I think this agreement in this room around what can we do working together to raise investment in health systems overall. And the fact that I think particularly in developing countries as we look in the next big topic of, of debate here the next five, 10 years with debt rising. It's gonna be an increasing challenge, probably to maintain where we are, let alone invest more. So kind of how we work together to do that is, is obviously really important. And actually, I, one of the things I've been noticing in some of the conversations, uh, both here and elsewhere, is the rising importance and awareness of NCDs, I think, in that picture. I think this is a, this is a great topic. And um, there's also a lot of talk on fragmentation. I think at the moment, I was actually back from the representing Gavi at the Pandemic Fund Board, uh, earlier this weekend, so the latest kid on the block of thinking this through. And I think it is incumbent on, on Gavi and other funds to think through how we work to deliver the mission that we've been given with the funding we've been given, but to strengthen systems overall. And you know, so one of the things we have is putting an increasing amount of our investment through government health systems. So you're not creating uh, a number of kind of different individual administrative areas that don't link to supporting governments overall, because what we should be doing is strengthening government's capacity to deliver, in our case, vaccines, but other services alongside them. And Fareed, you made a really important point there on, on I think, the role of immunization, strengthening primary health care so that it can deliver diagnostics, other things relevant for, for non-communicable disease. And so I think that is incumbent on Gavi and funds like it to see what we can do to contribute to the broader picture. And, and Veronica, I think on obviously vaccines in this area um, is key as well. Obviously not all non-communicable diseases, but HPV is a really good example. It's a relatively new introduction into Gavi's portfolio and one that we were excited to make progress on. Some of that progress was stymied during the pandemic. Again, the question of priorities and, and where do things come, but we are relaunching that huge percent potential, as you say, to early investments at scale make massive societal, economic and health benefits over the long term. And there's some exciting things coming up in the in the vaccine industry in, in, in this area as well. Obviously, we would stand ready to, to do that. But one of the things I was thinking about as well, reflecting and on, on what you said on the private sector and just thinking about, um, uh, and this is maybe where I'll disagree with Juan Pablo a little bit, because I do think that, you know, when you want to make changes in public investment and make things happen, you know, it is okay to shine a spotlight on areas where you think there's underinvestment, right? You've got to use data, you use analysis, change happens through being specific with that. So I think what are some of the things that kind of Gavi has done over 20, 25 years that could be applied into this area? And I think some of the some of the things that I think about is that, you know, Gavi was set up for vaccines in a, in a world where you had um, expensive vaccines 
with uh, which required a lot of investment and high profit margins in developed countries, um, but there wasn't, there simply wasn't a market for those products to be done in ways that could be delivered and used in developing countries at scale. So it took kind of Gavi working in a public-private partnership together, procuring cumulatively, so you have pool procurement, so you actually have demand to think about changing an incentive for an industry to lower prices, but still interested in margin because you can have a larger margin and then it can accommodate lower prices. So I think some of that also needs to be applied and could be applied in the field of non-communicable diseases because there are a lot of quite high cost treatments that could, with investment, with partnerships with the private sector together, make a bit of a difference. I think that's such an important point. We have success stories. Let's not forget, like this has worked in other areas where market shaping, bringing in the private sector has worked. We've got a hand down here I want to take first and then we'll, we'll come to others. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Thank you. So uh, thank you first for having me into this uh, very, very interesting roundtable dialogue. My, my name is Miriam Tamimi. I am the president of actually the Trade Association, which is including uh, all biopharma companies uh, operating in Morocco uh, and uh, being present actually since more than 30 years in, in Morocco and, uh, and supporting the authorities into shaping, let's say, the markets. I think I wanted to bring maybe here a little bit the example of Morocco itself because it is undergoing a, a, a very strong, of course, healthcare reform uh, through the, the expansion of the, the UHC. And at the same time, while considering this expansion, uh, also reviewing the whole healthcare infrastructure around it. So for us, from our perspective, this is a great momentum uh, we are facing in the country, while uh, when I'm hearing all the, the comments around the table, and uh, one specific one which was about the rolling protection, finan the financial protection that is being, for now, maybe the, um, the, 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 the thing that emerges the most when we are undergoing dialogue with the authorities around the importance of including innovation very early on, uh, whatever it is around prevention with vaccine or even in oncology or immune disease which are uh, growing in terms of unmet needs as well in the country, um, we still see this focus on the rolling financial protection because, of course, the basics and the fundamentals are still considered towards the cost rather than investment as Morocco is spending still 6% GDP around healthcare and not more than that. So how do we... Um, uh, let's say, try to move the needle when we are discussing with the authorities and uh, we opened the dialogue uh, a while ago, a few years ago already, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring the innovation as soon as now rather than being considered as a nice to have to be included after they do the expansion. And, and, and trying to really uh, provide solutions. And solutions, just as were mentioned before, uh, can be very interesting, maybe adding a point on the patient, the total patient uh, pathway. If I look at Morocco considering uh, decentralizing healthcare management through regions and territories to be uh, able to customize their approach because different level of unmet needs are now being um, uh, seen across the region of the country. Uh, bringing innovation is not only bringing an innovative drugs, just like uh, has been said before, it's technologies, it's digitalization, it's uh, capabilities as well, uh, is able to streamline this, this patient pathway and obviously we're going to end up with savings, cost savings beyond uh, the, 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 the drug cost itself, we are going to be able to provide cost saving in direct and direct cost saving. The direct one, for the solutions we are uh, providing today can go also through managed entry agreements and being and giving the opportunity to us as license holders uh, to, to contract directly through private public partnership where the payer is sitting in an open and transparent dialogue uh, with our members under a regulator, of course, to be able to come up with financial deals and there are different type of mechanism that we have been sharing with the, with, with the authorities, starting from pure volume-based agreement. We don't need to sophisticate it that much at this point, and we can go step by step uh, to, 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 to manage or to maybe mitigate a little bit the costs 
of the drugs that is seen today as maybe difficult to address mm -hmm. for our countries. So there are efforts that can be put on the table as such as maybe with the help of the financing um, institutions, uh, providing maybe, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, one of the, the key topics that was uh, raised, for example, is we are ready to, to, to make contracts, managed entry agreements. We need a, a funding um, host, let's say, like a fund, where we could be uh, ensuring that there is a transparent exchange on those deals that we are going to contract a company with a payer and uh, to be able to follow up and monitor that in a very open and transparent way. So maybe one other thing that uh, we would like to mention is how do we build trust around the table yeah. while we have all these this stakeholder faculty here, having also our health authorities and all the stakeholders, not only health authorities, by the way, sitting with us in an open and transparent way, rather than considering us as, um, let's say, um, a, cost, right. a costly part or a luxury uh, uh, partner for the health of the population. Thank you, Mary, for bringing both the case of Morocco to the table, it's so important since we're here, but also some practical issues, the really tangible issues that I think we can help to address. Well, believe it or not, we're running out of time. So I, I want to see if we can take maybe two more brief comments from this group. I want to go back to Allison and Marianne then. And uh, we're going to end with Juan Pablo. So uh, let's see if we can get one or two more thoughts. Right here next to me, you have a microphone there, sir. Go ahead, George. Let me see. OK, thank you, Che. Um, my name is George Aup. I'm from the Bank of Papua New Guinea. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a banker, you know, and I'm surrounded by a lot of health specialists here. And I've not been in the area of uh, health, but I've been, I've been in the area of financial inclusion space. And I see uh, cancer patients or sick patients can sometimes be excluded from the financial system. So how do we bring those people back into the financial system is my primary concern when a central bank is involved in this kind of thing. So we are thinking about finance. How do we make them feasible? And how do we make, get them to become part of the finance system when they are cured? Uh, cancer is a very difficult subject, of course. Uh, whether they can be cured or not, then, then we only try to prevent. And cancer sometimes eats away until the person dies. When I'm thinking of climate change and I look at cancer as a topic, you know, I have a feeling that cancer might have picked up very strongly after the World War. And it has not slowed down uh, in respect of different causes. And now we are having climate change effects. And cancer is still going at a very rapid pace than we, have, we know. And so how do we address this situation before uh, it has a, a very negative impact on, on human beings, I'll, no matter which country you come from? I'll just ask you to wrap up quickly because I'm worried about time. Yeah. Is that your final point? <clears throat> yeah, so okay. To make it this way, you know, I think we need public-private public, private partnership in this respect. And when we're talking about prevention, prevention might be a short run issue. Mm -hmm. If we really need innovation, innovation in the area to fund cancer projects, which means we need to find cure. We have to find cure. Funding has to be put into the private sector that is driving uh, the real, mm -hmm. real medicines that can be used to prevent the disease. That's what I can say. Uh, if we try to improve the system in the delivery mechanisms, it's only addressing, but not really addressing the issue. We need to find cure for it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think we had a, a hand down there. Go ahead. If you can be, be short, that would be great. Sorry. I'm just running out of time a little bit. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dr. Amr Mawzud from Morocco. I'm a health economist and uh, MD. I represent here the, the Moroccan Society of Health Economics. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, great round table with the great panelists. I want uh, just to emphasize two points. For uh, countries like Morocco, low middle income countries, the idea of uh, universal health coverage, which is uh, a great decision for a country like Morocco, uh, 
uh, there is one struggling point with the universal coverage for the entire population. We have to define what is this uh, coverage for which kind of care, for which level of care. It's for the standard of care for the entire population, not only cancer patients, but cancer patients, dialysis patients, Alzheimer disease, cardiovascular disease, or just a care for one or two or three uh, uh, diseases. The idea is to cover the entire population and offer uh, the standard of care. But w when we talk in, from a financial point of view, the system is not sustainable for more than two, three years. We have done some simulations about uh, anemia related, uh, uh, cancer related anemia. If we cover the entire population in the horizon of three, five years, the budget of anemia will be more than 50% the entire budget of the health insurance systems. Yeah. So for one disease, one indication, the system will collapse. So we have to, to be ready for this tsunami that is coming from now to uh, two, three years. So we have the stakeholders, the academicians, the big pharma, the, the local companies, we have to work together to find innovative financial system, maybe value-based, maybe some uh, risk-sharing agreements between the government and the, the pharma, uh, maybe some uh, bundled payments, maybe uh, outcome-based payments. There are a lot of ideas, but we have to work from now because which, uh, the winter is coming, yep. but the winter is coming. Uh, <laughs> Even here uh, in Morocco, it's coming, <laughs> I know. And so much of this really is about that business model, right, as Veronica brought into the conversation. So I want, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you and others off, but I do want to make sure we get to our, our last interventions before we have to close. Allison, I want to hear your take on, on everything you've heard so far and give us a final thought. Great. Well, it's been a very, very rich conversation, and I've been wanting to leap in from the very minute I heard Juan Pablo's response to what I was saying. To be really clear... Uh, this is not about special pleading for NCDs. Our message is very much about integration being the solution. But uh, you know, as, as uh, the colleague from Gavi was saying, there is a significant gap we have to shine a light on, and, and that is NCDs. And if we want to achieve UHC, we have to achieve progress on NCDs. However, there is a really strong um, an, uh, case and emerging evidence around the, the cost effectiveness, both for patients and the health systems, of leveraging these existing siloed systems to provide better integrated patient-centered care. Um, and that includes, uh, you know, we've been talking about, uh, you know, screening, um, basic prevention activities, when we are delivering other kinds of care that already exist, like HIV AIDS care, uh, maternal and child health care. Um, and the other thing I wanted to respond to is this sort of, this idea about that, again, Juan Pablo brought in about the cost of the secondary and tertiary care for cancer. Uh, and I'm mindful of that article by Richard Horton that came out just before the high level meetings where he said, you know, when we're talking about universal health coverage, primary health care is not enough. And my response to that is, well, it would be a really huge start. Um, prevention, screening, early diagnosis could have a massive contribution to saving lives and saving costs for cancer. So, yeah, I'll leave it there because I know time is short. Yeah, I appreciate that, though, and I appreciate how much Juan Pablo is being brought it back into the discussion. You are going to get a chance to help wrap us up, but uh, Marianne, I, I want to come to you, especially because the two of you are going to miss out on the great reception that we are having <laughs> after this. So, Marianne, what are your concluding thoughts? Thank you. I'd, I'd like to follow up on Allison's point around where can we start and where would be really good starts. And... Um, speak back to the uh, sorry to the contributions of local private sector and local private providers, um, especially as it relates to the point around um, tertiary care expense, uh, you know, kind of investing in expensive uh, equipment, etc. And you know, through our MSD for Mothers program, we've had experience in how to work with local private providers to actually um, bring new capital to the table so that they can invest 
in these um, services and, and infrastructure, uh, you know, that have quite high capital costs. And in that way, they're able to fill some of the gap in the health system. If you're talking about a health system that is made up of both private service delivery and uh, public service delivery, um, to meet some of these um, high high level uh, high level gaps, and I do think that there are ways through bended financing as well as through insurance riders, and and there are examples out there that we can learn from and and pull learnings and best practices and impact from to start to fill in that gap, you know, as we all are working around the table to come up with those more difficult, more complex, long-term solutions. So I think my message is let's not wait um, to find the perfect solution. Um, Let's start the work we have with the tools and levers that we have and the lessons that we have learned you know, from the global community's efforts to actually solve for providing high complexity, high quality care and incentivizing providers, whether they're in the private sector or local um, uh, private sector or public sector to deliver on high quality care. We know it's the lack of quality um, that is actually um, resulting in about 60% of the deaths at UHC. Quality is a big pillar there. And, and so I do think that that's a place we can start to focus on through these multi-sectoral partnerships. Thank you. That's really helpful, Marianne. And it helps ground, I think, the conversation from, well, this is a pie in the sky idea. Maybe one day we'll treat all cancer to actually there are things we know that work that we can do right now, today, and make immediate progress. And in fact, as you say, look at the tools we have. One of those tools is the World Bank, which is one of the reasons I wanted to end with Juan Pablo, because uh, you know, we're here at the annual meetings, and when we think about an integrated approach to care, including for NCDs and cancer, when we think about public-private partnerships, integrating technology, changing the business model, you know, there's a pretty indispensable institution at the table, which is the World Bank. Right? There's a reason why all eyes are on the World Bank under the new leadership of Ajay Banga. This is the place where government and international organizations and all the issues we're talking about have a natural interface. So your name has been used in vain a lot today, Juan Pablo. Let's, let's hear your response to some of that and, and help us kind of wrap up how we should think about this and take it forward to some kind of an action agenda for all of us. <laughs> oh, you want to say something too. Okay, go ahead. You, you. No, Raj, but I'm, I'm going to be very, very, very brief because I didn't know we had a great reception coming up. So I'm happy about it. No, four messages, um, and I'll let um, the difficult part to Farid. Uh, he'll talk about next steps. Uh, my first message is a huge thanks to DevEx and to MSD. This has been a great space because we have discussed, we've heard each other, we didn't come to read things, we came to, to have an open conversation, and it doesn't happen every day, so I'm extremely happy that we had a discussion, and again, thanks um, Alison and Marianne and um, everybody in MSD and, and in DevEx. My second message is, I think it's extremely important to advocate for all the different pieces of need and, and expectations and, and development. And by the way, I, I advocate for women, adolescents, and children. Many times I feel I'm very much alone in that advocacy, by the way. But my second message is, regardless of the need for advocacy, let's hopefully come down with it around health system strengthening. And it's a gradual construction of the capacities of health systems, what we need at all levels for so many different needs. My third message, in particular in cancer, I really, I really believe that the practical solutions at the country level come through financial protection mechanisms. Morocco is a great example. I would invite many of you to look at Colombia and what it did in terms of social protection and cancer and high cost. Um, we can look at, at Indonesia and what they're doing. Um, but cancer requires, because of its complexity, because of its continuum, it really requires the gradual building of financial uh, protection mechanisms. And once you have them, Raj, you have incredible opportunities to bring in the private sector and to innovate through many different uh, strategic purchasing functions. And I think those examples were great. And my fourth and last um, (laughs) comment is, we, we need to come together again and again and again around prioritizing 
investments in health and health systems at the country level. If that doesn't unite us, Raj, I don't see what will unite us. Ari, let's hear your closing thought. I'd like to say what we're going to do, because at the end of the day, it's Please. not just stating the problem is, is what the World Bank Group is, is trying to do to drive that. But one thing, I want to blow the myth on high-cost services, because we've seen, particularly on NCDs, but also on communicable diseases, that you can put the cost down. And that's been done how? That's been done through offtake. And I, I go back to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. The private sector, whether it's vaccines, whether it's diagnostic, if you give the private sector long-term visibility, predictability, and guarantee, they will bring costs down and services down. Gavi managed to do that through crowdsourcing of donor funding. And I think this is a fantastic mechanism. What prevents us today to build, through the World Bank, fifth financial in intermediary funds, and we've got a pandemic fund today, crowdsource that funding, and then have PPP type of structures at each country level, because that's a country approach that we need to have, and then give that visibility. And I can tell you, I've seen prices of a CT scan going from $600 to $12 in some countries, in Turkey, just because of doing that kind of offtake with the social security system. Now we need also Veronica to come on board because we need the insurance plans to make it viable to, and the HMO systems in some countries have managed that. Cost down, coverage plan of not 3,000 or $10,000 of insurance cost on medical plan, but $50. And then you, you solve the problem. So we're working together with Juan Pablo to do hybrid PPPs well, both the World Bank and the IFC on the demand side, country side, and IFC side, we manage to support, de-risk some of the elements through upfront CapEx financing or de-risking of payment of unitary charge, not over five years, over 10 years, 30 years. And then you're gonna see the private sector and others localizing the services in the countries. And we've seen that in Morocco. I remember oncology 10 years ago, when we introduced in my previous life, the first cyclotron and PET CTs, and there was no reimbursement. There was no insurance system. The minute it picked up, the low change, and now you've got seriously... Uh, so I think that I just want to blow the myth of, no, it's not possible for emerging countries. It is. Now, the problem is we need to learn from the systems in the OCD countries where costs have gone up instead of going down. You know? And that you need absolutely to definitely, if there is a leapfrog opportunities, that's probably the one. I'm so glad that you've ended there because I'm listening to all of this discussion along the way. I was reminded of the late great Paul Farmer who used to talk about uh, the socialization of scarcity. Right? And I think in global health, we often fall into that trap, this idea that, well, money is tight, we don't have enough resources, there's no way we can fund everything, so we've got to, you know, make choices. And we talk about best buys, and that mentality makes a lot of sense, and there are certainly examples where it's really applicable. But ultimately, we're talking about a market failure that fails people's lives, right? And the only way to solve that is to actually get all of you together, who represent all aspects of these issues, and to reshape the market to find a new way to approach it. And as you say, the financial engineering is all happening, you know, just across the way at the, at the Global Conference Center. People are thinking about how do you re-engineer the international financial architecture? And I just end on where I started. Well, for what? What are we re-engineering it for? Let's re-engineer it for health. And I think there's a huge opportunity there. So I am thrilled uh, that we at DevX have the chance to partner with our colleagues at MSD to bring what I think is a really critical discussion to the sidelines of this event. Hopefully you too felt that it's been a great discussion, uh, a really valuable one, and um, you know, not the usual talking points, as Juan Pablo said. Also, we're gonna feed you, not, not the usual reception. There's, there's food and there's drink out there. Sorry, Marianne and Allison, but if you're here, please join us and continue the discussion. My, my great thanks to MSD and to all of you for being here. Thanks. Thank you.